First stop, the glamorous district of Kensington, an ideal location for hairdressing entrepreneur Sean Palfrey, who's looking to make his fortune in an industry worth over £5 billion a year. Sean entered the den in 2007 with an innovation he hoped would revolutionise the hairdressing industry. Offering a 15% stake in his company, he knew it would be a tough job to gain £80,000 of the Dragon's own money. I was expecting the worst, that way I wouldn't be disappointed. I thought I covered all aspects about the product, where I was going and things, and so I felt it was a, a nice, solid presentation itself. Tangled, knotted hair drives hairdressers insane. Tangled teasers, uniquely designed teeth, will glide through the hair, removing knots and tangles that is a cause and associated with conventional tools on the market today. <clears throat> and we get them. Now, there is two markets for Tangle Teaser. One is consumer and one is the trade. I will be taking Tangle Teaser to the trade. Already, it has received two nominations for finalist competition for innovation within the trade itself. And finally, not only do I stand here for investment today, I am also looking for a dragon that can help me take this product to a global consumer market. Sean, what is, what is it that's so unique about this product? What is it that makes it untangled? OK. The product itself is actually in the teeth. The teeth has been designed in a slight three-tier system. So when they actually touch into the hair, rather than obviously in the conventional way, it causes friction, the teeth are designed to collapse and spring back. Sean, <coughs> you're obviously a hairdresser. Hair colourist, yes. Hair colourist. Yes. What's the difference? And I, I specifically divide just in colouring hair itself. I don't blow dry cut or style. I just colour. You just colour. I do Sorry, sorry. Could we just go back on that? Oh, I'm what sorry. You, say? you just, you just colour. colours. Like her hair. I think, well, I, I colour, yes, like yeah. Deborah's highlight. But you clearly don't, because there isn't any colour on this. Oh, well, I beg your pardon, it's one beautiful <laughs> colour. Well, there you go. Sean, <laughs> well, wonderful, well, one beautiful colour. Go back to my question. I've coloured it quite question was about you, Sean. Yeah. Right, so you colour here. Okay. Yeah. And uh, when did you invent this and come up with this idea? If I was pitching for £80,000 of somebody's own cash, I would avoid accusing them of dyeing their hair. I think I turned around and offended Deborah quite badly regarding a certain hair colour, and it was obviously unintentional. It was just that the product works really well on coloured hair. So I think she wasn't too pleased about that. Have you got the patent on this? Have you? I, as far as the patent goes, recently I received information about from my patent lawyer. There'd been some citations made against it, but no citations had been made against the tea. Um, what's the difference between? this and the horse grooming tools that are used with sort of collapse well it looks exactly like that actually so i'm just interested how you think you can get protection on something that i think i've got in my stables at home uh, from what i received back from my patent lawyer was that the actual design of my teeth there'd be no citation the one you may have back in your stable may flex and feel I think like you're it. missing the point sean you okay. see i don't care how this okay. is designed mm -hmm. i don't care how yours is designed i don't care how the one back in my stables is designed all I care is that it does its job. OK. So if there is already a product out there that's doing exactly the same as yours, albeit for horses, mm -hmm. but it would be very easy to say, well, let's make a smaller one and sell them. OK. I don't know. I, I've never seen the one for horses, but all I can tell you and say that is that I shall certainly look at that one for horses and see if it functions and performs like mine. Sean suddenly sounding less confident under the scrutiny of keen equestrian Deborah Meaden. He needs to get his pitch back on track quickly. Sean, um, how many of these have you put into the market for testing? There must be about 300, 350 floating around over the night. And how many, how much, what's the stats on the feedback? How many feedback people? Feedback that I've, I've had from that? How many people? Um, I would say up to, well, just recently, it's the collection, 20. I had never actually gone any further with that feedback because for the simple reason, I have not had the product to actually sell. And that's why there's never been an actual... Why didn't you sell some of the 300 instead of giving them away? Because I was more interested in getting the feedback from the people themselves actually using them. But you haven't got the feedback. You just told Peter you had 20 feedback out of 300. Why didn't you give them away and say, OK, I want feedback within two weeks? 
That, no, that is the feedback that I've just recently chased up. That isn't... Sean, just listening to your answers, you know, I think, you know, working with you, you'd have me pull my hair out. It's not a business, Sean. It's, it's not a business that we make any money. And, uh, you know, well, I'm out. Sean's lost his first dragon. Will Peter Jones share the concerns of his rival investor? Sean, this is really frustrating because you can't give me any indication that your product is good. You've just got a brush. That's all it is. Unless you can come in here and say, I've gone out to 300 people, 280 have signed up to some research because they got received it free. 276 of them said they will buy one and they're willing to place an order. I wish you the best of luck. Okay. But until you have research that's backed up, you can't get an investment from somebody, no the least problem. of all me. That's so I'm nice. going to declare myself out now. If you got £80,000 from somebody here today, what would you do with it? What would I do with it? Um, I would use it, first of all, for a stock investment. Yeah. I would also then use it to um, put more full-time into this to, for, for promotion. What does that mean? I'd have to actually reduce my work hours at work. So how much of this 80000 would you be...? 30. 30, yeah. So 30 of it's going to go to cover your costs and the rest of it in stock. Mm -hmm. How are we going to make money out of this investment then? From the from initial sales going into the wholesale through the hairdressers and from online. So how many would you have to sell? And, and the first go? Yeah. The first run, two, uh, 20,000. And they're going to cost you how much each? What to make? £1.25p. And you're going to sell them to the trade? Yes. How much? £5.50. Have any of the wholesalers uh, given you an indication uh, that they will take this? I haven't had the product to sell, so the answer to that has been no, but well, I will well, be well, doing well, that. Well, so. that's absolute rubbish. Not having the product to sell is irrelevant. Actually knowing whether they're going to take it, you can then make the product. But then I've actually You're not going to make the product and then have 20,000 sitting in your back bedroom and them saying, actually, Sean, it's rubbish, mate. Well, that's not clever, is it? You really had one job to do today, which was demonstrate that this is a cracking product and it's the product that needs to go out there. You haven't demonstrated that. You talk about your patent protection. Even if you did get a patent, the patent will be meaningless because there are other products out there that might be slightly different in their mm -hmm. design, but they actually do the job. And if they see this out there, oh, that's a good idea. We'll do it in the hair market. So I'm sorry, I'm out. Sean, can I tell you where I am? Um, I think you haven't really thought this through very carefully at all. You haven't really got a qualified patent yet. I think so, from my perspective, I think this is a waste of time, so I'm out. The Dragon's confidence in Sean's business acumen is slipping away. All that now lies between him and expulsion from the den is Theopafetis. You're going about this all wrong. You've failed dismally to actually do the basic things. If you'd have come here and said, I've spoken to three distributors, they'll all take it, they know the industry, they know the salons, done, done deal. You didn't do it. Okay. For those reasons, I too am out. Well, Theo, I thank you, and that's exactly what I'm going to do when I leave here. Do it. Thank you. I will do. Fantastic. Thank you very Sean. much indeed. I think Sean should have taken quite a lot away from the den, and that is how to demonstrate his product how to be non-aggressive towards the people that are going to invest in them. It's a hair-brained idea. And whether or not he should talk to distributors, there's so much he should have taken away that I think he should have gained from the experience. So it's almost two years since the den and Sean's brush is out and on the market. Has he learned any lessons from the ultra-critical dragons? I did not receive any investment from the dragons. What I did receive was some good advice, I took that advice and obviously put it into action. All in all, we've crossed quite a few sectors, high street into the professional and direct into the, to the consumer, so business is excellent, thank you. Duncan Bannatyne is in Kensington to see whether Sean did indeed leave the den a wiser entrepreneur. Hi, right, Sean, how are you? I do get on very well, thank you. Good, yeah. nice to see you. Good, nice to see you. How are you doing? Yeah, not too bad at all, thank you. Sean's keen that Duncan gets to see his invention in its own setting. Right over here, Duncan, we have the Tangled Teaser in action. There you can go. Maybe you'd like to have a go at it this time round. Um, yeah, go on. Then. We're going to... <laughs> a live model this time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely. Maybe you should have a live model when you came in Dragon's Den. You didn't do that, did you? Would that have made any, yeah. any difference? I think it might have done. Oh, I think definitely. it might have done. It might have worked. Nice. Yeah, we'd all have come up and tried it. Yeah. The product works, and it's better than a comb. 
There's no doubt about that. So many of you sold? John is here, and this is God's honest truth. We've manufactured over 250,000. The question date. was, how many have you sold? 250,000. You've sold 250,000? Yeah. No so stock? Drive stock, I do rolling stock. We do forecasts. We manufacture here in the UK. Yep. So um, we, ne we never stockpile. But this dragon wants the full lowdown on the company. And how much have you made? What manufacturing the product to actually make. Yeah, Last year, FIT profit? I am. Pre-tax, this year, £127,000 to make profit. So if I get your accounts from Company's House, it's £127,000. The accountants did all the books, yeah. They're not in Company's House yet, because I just got last year's and they should have lost. We did. We made loss of 18000 last year. This right. year we made a pre-tax profit of £127,000. Sean's business may be growing, but he knows he's got a long way to go. I've learned a hell of a lot. I certainly don't confess to know it all. I'm going to be the first to say, I need help, where do I go? Or, you know, if I need an answer to a question, I find a person who's got the answer. Listen, nobody knows everything about business. No. Business is not an exact science, yeah. and we're learning every day. And I learn in Dragon's Den every single week. Some of the Dragons will tell you, they know yeah. everything about business, they've been to school in business, yeah. and, like, and they know everything, and they say that, yeah. but they don't. They learn, we all learn yeah. every time. I often get asked by individuals and the press, Mm -hmm. Which is the one that got away? Which is the one that you wish you'd invested in that you didn't? Mm -hmm. And I have one or two that I mentioned, but maybe this is the one that will take over now. Didn't walk away with cash, but I walk away with valuable advice. And like I said, I wasn't too afraid to admit it and yeah, obviously go away and use it. No, I think you've done very, very well. Okay, well, coming for you, Duncan, that is an absolute honor. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you. All the best. You too. Good luck. Thank you. I do think we give Sean a little bit of too hard of a time on Dragon's Den. I think this product and other products that Sean's inventing, in the industry that he's in, I've got the potential to make him quite a lot of money, a really good living, and perhaps a seven-figure sum. Valuing a company at a million pounds or more often riles the dragons. If you're going in there doing that, you'd better have some good figures to make your case. Can our next entrepreneur, James Nash from Surrey, justify a £250,000 investment for 25% of his company? Hello, my name's James Nash. I'm the Managing Director of Wine Innovations Limited, and I'm here today to ask the Dragons for £250,000 for 25% of my company. I've been working in the outdoor events arena for some time. I also uh, <coughs> went to one event where I saw glass bottles be decanted into cardboard cups, and it didn't look very nice at all. So I thought, that's horrible. If I could uh, come up with a good idea, that enable people to pour wine or take wine in a goblet ready to serve. It's got to be the ideal way. So that's exactly what I did. It was nerve-wracking because this was money that was generally needed. <clears throat> I was spent out by now. I mean, nearly £300,000 me and my wife have put in. So we were thinking, God, if we, if we don't get this money, um, it could be the end of the company. It's plastic, you can bend it, which a lot of people are amazed at. Um, to demonstrate how strong they are, uh, one of the things that um, we like to show people is I put my nine stone on it and as you can see <laughs> it completely doesn't break at all. It's fast to serve, it's easy to peel, the consumers love it, they can pick one, two, three up, go back to their seats, it's perfect for them. We have a patent which enables us to do the whole process of filling the wine glass sealing it and just before we seal it we put our secret patent way of making sure that the the oxygen's taken out and an inert gas goes in which seals it and gives us a 12 month shelf life which is great for the product <coughs> we're selling it into big wine companies right here and i'm hoping that um, we'll get your support to take it into america where we've got a lot of inquiries and also europe for the moment i'd like to give you all the, the product and, and uh, demonstrate how good it is and then welcome any questions and answers from you. Um, how many of you actually got out there? How many people have adopted this form of selling well, at the moment wine? We, we've done trials last year. We took it up to the Rod Stewart concert at Hampton Park and we sold 20,000 units in one evening of four hours. And then to make sure it wasn't beginner's luck, we went to the Chili Peppers concert three weeks later and we sold 23,000 at that event 
OK. And can you brand this? Yes, we, that's what we do. We are, we're a packaging company and um, we've been working hard with the world leading brand that's coming on board and you will see uh, a brand label on the top there. OK, and what's the implications of that for the business? Well, at the moment they're offering us possibly three million units in the first what year. What does possibly offering us three million well, units? Well, we've got a letter of intent with us with us at the moment. Can I see it? Yes, certainly. It's an immense deal and James's initial nerves seem to be settling. Now, James Kahn wants to interrogate him on his financials. What's the um, production cost per unit? Can you give me some numbers? Well, at the moment, the whole thing is going to cost me 38p. We would sell it to the wine brand owners for about 53. They then take it to market for me. I don't have to do the distribution. I'm just the packaging company that packs their wine and their brand. OK, so you think you'll do three million. Where did, what did you base the three million on? Well, basically, they've given us they've given an indication on their case, their case prices, that the cases that they're going to order off me. OK, if that deal doesn't happen... Yep. Um, ..would you still be projecting three million units? If that didn't happen, we'd go where, with possibly our, our, an own label that we know, and that might be about one and a half to two. So, therefore, your profits would drop by 50%? Yes. Yes, absolutely. So you're putting your valuation on the back of your letter of intent? Yes, yes. James is confident in his future deal. But Duncan Bannatyne is concerned that copycat rivals could easily steal sales away. James, come on, this is, this is yep. the plastic glass. Yep. You didn't invent the plastic glass? No, not at all. OK, it's going to be filled with wine. You didn't invent the wine, you don't run the wine. No, that's right. It's going to have a seal on the top. You yep. didn't invent the seal because there's loads of things that have yep. got seals on the top. Absolutely. So what, what have you got? To see? Why can't a wine seller make his own glass, put it in and put a tap on it? Well, I think that there's nothing to stop them except that I've got there first. I've got a patent which protects the process of doing it. The process of putting the top on, on this? Yeah, the and, top? Well, no, no, it's, it's making sure that we, write, we get rid of the oxygen and put an inert gas in it so we get a 12-month shelf life. James, yep. is it a patent that you've applied for or is it a patent no. that you've actually yes, we've applied been for a patent. granted? No, it's, a, it's an applied for patent, so we've got uh, 12, 12 to 18 months before it's granted if there's no objections. And when did you apply? Uh, not long ago. We had to wait till the machine was built, and it was only about three weeks ago. I've never well, had that one before. Well, before the, proce you for the, the process of getting the glass through the filling machine... You could have applied for the patent for the machine before you started manufacturing the machine. Well, we had to, get the, we had to understand the way that the glass was accepted to the, to the machine. You don't understand it before you started making the machine? Well, basically, I've, it's brand new. It's a brand new technology. It's brand new to me. So we've actually, you know, it's a little bit of, um, you know, we're a brand new company. James is faltering under cross-examination. In the meantime, Deborah Meaden has been scrutinising his all-important letter of intent. I'm a bit confused of what I'm looking at. I was expecting to see a letter that said I'm intending to buy from you. No, they've, they said they, they sent me that through as their intention of the order with the SKUs yeah, and yeah, the Yeah, but postcodes. James, this isn't what this is. This, there isn't, there's, there's nothing here that says I actually intend to buy this product from you. This is one of those moments when I looked at what was supposed to be a letter of intent and realised it wasn't actually a letter of intent, that I just thought, oh, no. I think it's amazing that many people come along to the den and they say they have an order or a letter of intent or something and we read the letter... And I like, it isn't what they think it is or what they said it is. It's something completely different. I was kind of expecting, uh, 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 I think yeah, you no, said, they, a three million... Yeah, yeah no, they've, they've said they're not prepared to do that yet until we've done the QA. Well, but when I ask you for a letter of... Do, what do you think a letter of intent is? I, I, a letter of intent is somebody pre prepared to purchase the product off you. OK, well, this isn't everybody. This is a list of his products, and if they purchase the product, then that might be what it would cost. James, just so I can go back to the, the question I asked you previously, you value your business at a million pounds, and I yep. said, is that on the strength of your letter of intent? It's to in which you said, of... yes, it was. Yes. And now we've established that we have no orders. Yep. So... It's a verbal... They've given us a verbal indication of what they're looking to do. As a venture why... capitalist, do you think I value businesses on some vague statement that somebody makes? Or do you think I base it on tangible numbers, Absolutely, orders? Absolutely, no, tangible numbers and uh, opportunities. I'm out. Thank you.
Can I tell you where I am? Yes. Sadly, James, a letter of intent turned into an extremely weakened version of that. Mm -hmm. It turned into a letter, it was just a letter. There's too many if, buts or maybes on this one. So I'm afraid I'm out. James has alienated two dragons. Theopophetus still has some unanswered questions about the patent. What happens if I give you £250,000 yep. of my money uh -huh. and the patent office just laughs at you? Well, at the moment, I mean, I, I can't... Yeah, I mean, at the moment, we've applied for a patent, we've got, we've got 18 months to get our product to market before anyone objects. James, I'm, uh, I think that you know that your patent will have a load of objections. I think you know your patent won't stand up. Well, um, my marketing director, who's downstairs waiting for me, can give you some facts and figures on it. So he, he knows all it. about the patents and how it sells. And... Yeah, well, he comes from one of the leading wine brand uh, owners and saw it and said, I like this product. Let me see your market manager then. OK, I'd like to ask Ian Bring to come up. In a bid to salvage his pitch, James has called upon his advocate, Ian Belcher. Hello, Dragons. Tell me about you, Ian. What have you done? Um, I actually have 10 years' experience in the wine industry. Um, I've been working uh, as the European marketing controller for one of the largest wine companies. Uh, that would be Gallo Winery. Uh, James approached me with the, with the idea and said, Ian, I want you to have a look at this. Yep. And I have to say, in my 10 years' experience within the wine industry, I think it's one of the most innovative products that I've seen. And so you placed an order for how many? Um, no, uh, at that time... Well, wait a minute, you're working for Gallo Wines. James approaches you with this, you think, it's the most innovative thing I've seen in the wine industry for 10 years. James, here's an order. No, for the, uh, we, we didn't place an order because at that time James was, was talking to an even bigger wine company at the time. And uh, that's, that's where we're at at the moment. And what happened to an even bigger wine company then? Have they placed an order? We have a verbal agreement. Admittedly, it's only verbal. But By once this we time, passed the QA the pitch, process, um, big tick box on that. I was like, just so fed up with it. It was just absolutely ludicrous, ridiculous. So no one's placed an order, which proves to me that it doesn't work as a selling item because people don't want to buy wine and plastic glasses like that. We're selling top. It's as simple as that. So for that reason, I'm out. OK. It's a damning condemnation. Now only Peter Jones and Theopophetus are still in. James, I think you've asked for a ridiculous amount of money. OK. I think you should have come in here and said, I'm not sure what I've got. I've got a verbal arrangement, but, hey, it's a punt. Mm. And if it works, it could be good for you. I would have invested in that, but you've placed yourself out of the market. £250,000 is ridiculous, yeah. and that's the reason why I'm out. OK, thank you. OK. For me to actually invest and not know whether in six months' time, six weeks' time, something comes out the woodwork, because you've only applied three weeks ago for a patent, and I have not got a business, and my money's lost, is not a risk that I'm prepared to take for a quarter of a million pounds. So that's why I'm out. OK, okay. thank you. James couldn't prove his product would make any money, and the remaining dragons passed on the opportunity. Coming out with a no was pretty um, daunting, really, and I thought, oh, oh my God, you know, what, what's going to happen? I've, you know, I'm going to lose my house and everything. But luckily for James, not everyone agrees with the dragons. I got a phone call and somebody said, look, I, I've seen your product, I love it, could I invest? He saw merit in it and said, I'm going to invest the 250000 for 20% of your company. <laughs> in a way, it was a big relief. <laughs> the goblets may be selling well as events, but the low profit margins mean he needs to start shifting in volume in a major multiple. Seeing the product in Marks and Spencer stores absolutely sends my hairs on my back of my neck go up. There are plans now to roll out the goblets nationwide, but is it enough to finally make James a profit? Great. That looks good. We're expecting to produce somewhere in the region of about three and a half to 
four million units, which would actually give us the gross turnover of about 1.8 million pounds. James's projections are ambitious, and now he wants to prove to Duncan that he got it wrong. I don't think I'm going to say I told you so, but hopefully he'll see the product and think to himself, oh yeah, this guy done okay. But it's not going to be easy. I'm very sceptical about to how it's selling, whether they're selling one per week or two per week, or even slightly more than that. But I'm here to see. Well, I am a bit nervous, but I'm not as nervous as I was when I was in the Dragon's Den. And hopefully he'll see and appreciate what we've done. Here we go. Here he comes. Ready? Hello, Duncan. Yes, how are you? Thank you very much for coming right. to see me. No problem. Let's go, let's go, to bolster his case, James Thank has you. invited yeah. the head of packaging for Welcome food. To Thank you. And as you can see... So, this is the product? Yes, this is it. This is uh, the wine goblet, which we showed you in the Dragon's Den. And we've been very successful in getting the patents approved for the production right. and how we seal it to give us that yeah. uh, pattern, which was great. Very good. And how's it selling? Very well. It's exceeded all expectations. We're in double-digit growth, week on week. You know, if, um, um, if somebody expects to sell two and they sell three, then that's exceeded expectations. Absolutely true. They are increasing week on week in a substantial way, enough to give us the confidence to go into 600 stores. So the customer are obviously liking it. James has done everything good. he can, yeah. Yeah. but the Dragon yeah, is only well interested in one thing, profit. What's it cost you to produce it? It's, it's something around the 65, 70p. Mm. But that's without the wine in it, so... Oh, with and the Marks and Spencer's is under £2.25. There is very little margin in it. Well, it's volume-related. It's like big product... Any product like this is all volume-related. From the figures he's been given, Duncan is convinced that James doesn't make enough profit. But James begs to differ. What we're turning over now, expectations for the end of the year, that £250,000 is going to be given back to our investors. So he's, he's more than happy at the moment, which is great news. Right? Yeah. Well, you're I, saying you could can buy that. his shares back off? Yeah, so £250,000, that's right. So we're already... 2010? Yes, end of 2010, yeah. You're not going to have £250,000 in the bank at the end of 2010. Duncan has a proposition, but it's not what James had in mind. I'll bet you 50 quid that your year-end results for 2010 your profit before tax will be a loss before tax. I'll take you up on that bet. 50 quid, OK, mate. Good you luck, can. anyway. Thank you very much. Nice to meet you, Helen. Thank Good you luck. very much. Thank you very Cheers, much. Now. Thank you for coming. It's selling for £2, minus the VAT, and it's costing over a pound to produce. So Master Spencer must be using a very, very thin margin, and James must be as well. There's very little profit now. It's got to sell an awful, awful lot. I sincerely hope that James proves me wrong, and I hope he does well, and I hope he makes a fortune, I hope he doesn't lose his house, but, you know... My head still rules my investments, and I wouldn't invest in this now. The margins are far too small for Duncan, but James isn't put off. Given the anguish and heartache I've gone through getting it to here, from my perspective, I'm over the moon, and, I'm, and I know my family are, and it's brilliant. It looks good, it holds the wine great for a year. Customers are loving it now, and, and, and I think that is giving me the confidence to answer Duncan back and say, Duncan, no, you're wrong. The first time you were wrong, this time you're wrong right here, and you'll be wrong again at the end of the year. The Dragon's Den tour continues into Bristol, which has always been at the hub of Britain's role as a trading nation. Bristol is one of the UK's most affluent cities, and is home to a vibrant design community, and to Rob Law, creator of one of the Den's best-loved products. Back in 2006, when businessman Richard Farley was part of the Dragon lineup, Rob came into the Den asking for £100,000 for 10% of his company. Well, it's just over three years since I was in the Den. It's not such a distant memory. I think Trixie the Pink Trunky still actually has nightmares about it. My name's Rob Law, and I'm here today looking for an investment of £100,000 for a 10% share in my company that design and distribute revolutionary luggage and travel products for little people under our very own Trunky brand. Now, I'm sure you're all aware and familiar with the stresses and strains associated with travelling with small children. Mixed toddlers, limited attention spans with the inevitable delays at airports, and you have a recipe for disaster that would challenge even the most experienced parents. 
even those of you who may happen to travel by private jet. So let me introduce you to a solution. Meet Terence and Trixie, the world's first and only ride-on suitcases for globe-trotting tots. Toddlers can pack, sit on and ride their trunkies while parents can keep their kids in tow, quite literally, the child sitting on the case. The trunkies are lightweight and durable, made out of the same materials adult suitcases are, with generous space inside for children to pack their favourite toys and games. I've designed it with a soft rubber rim so when the children are packing the case they can't hurt their fingers. But to date we've sold 20,000 units and are available through the Trunky website. Thank you for your time. Now would anyone like to test ride a Trunky? I'll, go, I'll do it. Here we go, have a go on Terence. Are you going to pull me along? Designer Rob Law has got off to a strong start with his pitch for £100,000 for a 10% share in his magmatic business, specialising in Trunky ride-on luggage for jet-setting toddlers. OK, Rob, thanks very much. That was uh, quite entertaining. And, and this looks fun. And, you know, I, I have six children, so I know what it's like travelling with them. So, so let me just go into the business aspect with you. You sold 20,000 all through your website? No, we've sold 200 through our website. Uh, we sold 260 at the Baby Show in Birmingham. Yep. Um, we've sold 566 to wholesalers so far. And to date, we've sold 19,000 to one customer in Saudi Arabia. Right. And, so they uh, bought 19,000 of these? They bought 19,000. So what price are you selling them at? Uh, in the UK, the, everyone has to retail at 24.99. No, that's not the question I asked you. Oh, sorry. You sold what price am I selling them? You sold 566 to wholesalers. What price did you £10. sell? £10. £10 each. We make 30% profit. So they cost you £7 to make? They're going out the door about 7 quid cost to us. Cost you 7 quid. Duncan Bannatyne seems impressed, both by Rob's sales and his thorough handle on his figures. Deborah Meaden wants to take a closer look at the luggage itself. I think they're great. They look great. They're very funky. I actually want to have a look at one. Sure, I, can are I there any stability? Show you this one with the what sales What happens rep? when a small... Bearing in mind you're putting small children on this. Yeah. I mean, I saw you wheel it in a straight line. What happens mm -hmm. if it... Oh, OK. Yeah, tri Trixie there will pretty much follow you around wherever you go. Mm. Okay. So have you had any feedback? Have you had we've any, sent, sent have you had any returns out. from we've the sent, ones that you've sold? We have had some returns, but that's due to um, the factory, the new factory that's manufacturing them. They've got the catches slightly wrong, so some of the catches are popping open. The turning point in the den from uh, a good pitch to things tumbling downhill out of my control was when Theo got a little bit too aggressive with my pink Trixie suitcase. I did not expect the strap to break so easily, I've got to be honest. <laughs> that got my attention. <laughs> what did you do there? It got my kids' attention as well. <laughs> Is this a fault to catch one? No, that's, you've pulled the, the hook off there, yeah? I shouldn't have done that, should I? Rob's suitcase isn't the only product that's been tested to the limit, Perfitas style. There is now the Theo test. Like, we'll hand it over to Theo and see whether or not it survives him, you know, and, and if it does, it's, it's clearly a robust product. Are you trying to break it, Theo? <laughs> we'll die. <laughs> there were several products that I know, if I sold them in my stores, would come back. The last thing you want as a retailer is products to come back. While Deborah Meaden has been grilling Rob, Theo Perfitis has been testing Trixie the Trunky himself and seems to have found a flaw. Can Rob get his pitch back on track after this setback? There is one, one slight issue with the case, is the hooks. They're the only thing I actually did not design. The factory got those in. Oh, sorry, that's not the only slight issue, this, that, this, it, and the catch. This, this yeah, hooks, the are, catch, this hooks okay. are rubbish. Yeah, I Aren't didn't they? design that, I'm afraid. No, but they are rubbish. Yeah. And in addition to being rubbish, when I pulled it, that happened. So why did that happen? Um, I'm not entirely sure. Rob's in real trouble. The Dragons now have serious concerns about the reliability of his colourful ride-on luggage. 
The moment Theo pulled that handle off, the whole integrity of the quality of that product was compromised. So I think you've done really well. Congratulations to get this far, but I just don't think it's a business opportunity. Okay. So I'm afraid I'm out. Rob, let me tell you where I am. You've got problems with the product. You've got problems what, that can be solved. Yeah, but you shouldn't come here with problems uh, uh, that can be solved without either identifying them or sorting them out first. And it, it drives me mad that we actually waste our time with these things. I too am out. Rob's been blasted by a furious Theopathetus, and he's lost two dragons in as many minutes. Now Peter Jones wants to know more about Rob's bid for £100,000 in return for a 10% slice of Trunky. Rob, hi. Um, why is your company worth a million pounds? I have a UK uh, trademark for Trunky and I'm in the pro halfway through the process of applying for a European trademark for Trunky. Yeah, so you're, you're trademarking and registering the name, so you've got a brand name. What, yeah. else, what else have you got? I have a European-wide design registration on the product. But design registration means nothing, doesn't it? Because I can copy that, just maybe change a couple of things and I'm away. This product, this type of product, is not patentable. No, it's not. And that's why I'm really concerned, because I don't understand why then you would have valued a business that's worthless now at a million pounds. Oh, I beg to differ that you think it's worthless. Um, well, but, but what have you got? <clears throat> I've got... Talking I could, out I could, in China that's making this product. Yeah, but we, one of the reasons why... Rob, Rob, let sorry. me understand what you've got, because th this is where it gets... And we, I see hundreds of people like you, and this is what, where there is a big issue here. Mm -hmm. The big issue is that you have nothing. You think you have something. I tell you, you don't. I'll tell you why you don't. Within seven days, I could do a better job than that, make sure that the clips are working, make sure the arm doesn't clip off. I could get tooling done in China within three, two to three weeks. I could have this in production by the end of next month. Your company is currently worthless. I'm out. Rob's been torn apart by Peter Jones. Now, will either Richard Farley or Duncan Bannatyne throw Rob the lifeline he so badly needs and rescue his bid for investment? When did you form this company? Back in February 2003. What's his balance sheet like? Does it have debt, sir? Yes. How much debt does it <clears> have? Um, looking at the balance sheet last night, about £55,000 have been invested through myself and my family. That's debt that the company owes? Or yes. Or is that equity? That's director's loans and uh, investment, yeah. So you'd be willing to put that £55,000 back? Yes. The Dragon's confidence in Rob's business acumen has been further dented, with the revelation that he expects money he's invested into the business to be paid back to him. Richard Farley is ready to reveal his position. You're charging twice because you own the company and you've got the company for the effort and money you've put in mm -hmm. and then you want us to invest in the company and then the company to pay you back. That, that was your investment in the business to get it to where it is. Mm -hmm. So if I was ever going to consider an investment, I would want that debt completely written off. Right, I don't, want to, you invest, want, to you I don't want to invest in a company... You only invest in businesses that don't owe any money. Not, not, to the, not to the people who set them up, and own the company. You've got shares for all that effort and money that you put mm -hmm. in. You've got the shares. Consequently, without even making you a firm, a firm offer, but just to know if it's worth continuing the conversation, mm -hmm. would you be prepared to move to something like half the company for 100 no, grand? <clears throat> the biggest reason that uh, you should still believe in the value. No, no, no. I, just, I, I don't want to be convinced. I just want your answer on whether you're m m whether you would negotiate right up to around about 50% on on the. On the I can go up to 50%. No. Nowhere near it. I can go to 50% now. OK, well, I'm out. I wish okay. you the best of luck. Thank you, Richard. Thanks. Rob's stubbornness has driven Richard Farley away from any further discussion. Only Duncan Bannatyne now stands between Rob and expulsion from the den. I want to tell you, I've had a think about this, and <clears throat> quite often we get products here and look at the product and think, I would buy that product but I wouldn't invest in the company. OK. This is actually different, because I wouldn't buy it. OK, why is that? Duncan? OK, because my children would want to be told about all the time and pulled along mm -hmm. in this, and I'd have my own trolley to pull, so I'd be pulling two trolleys. So I would actually lose out by it if I bought one. So I wouldn't buy okay. it, I wouldn't invest in the company. So I've no interest in this at all, so I'm going to declare myself out. But 
Thank you very much indeed. Thanks for your time, guys. Cheers. Cheers, Rob. After a great start, Rob plummeted in the Dragon's estimation and leaves the den empty-handed. Does everybody think we're fools? A million pounds for a business that doesn't exist. I think, I think he really thought it was worth that. I think he thought his little trunk of logo and everything was worth it. It was no going to make some money. No one in their right mind would think that was worth a million quid. Rob, how did how did you feel it went? It wasn't it wasn't all bad, was it? No, I thought it was pretty bad. Uh, they completely took me to pieces. Well, um, let's talk a bit about the valuation first, because obviously they just thought you were on the wrong planet. Yeah. Your company is currently worthless. I mean, for hundred thousand quid, they could have a whole company for themselves doing they that could. kind of thing. Well, probably, I didn't they? question Peter Jones's product design skills. Now, the other big moment, Theo pulled the hook off. Mm. What were you yeah. thinking at that stage? I was wondering why he was tugging on it so hard. It's designed for three to six year olds who don't have the kind of muscle power that Theo has in his, in his arms. <laughs> okay, well done. Okay, thanks, Evan. Cheers. Now, for the first time, Rob will come face to face with the dragon who destroyed his high hopes of investment in the den. Theo Pafitis. Last time I met Theo, we had a bit of a run in in the den. That was over three years ago now, so really looking forward to meeting him today just so that I can show him how much I've managed to grow the business on my own. Hello, Rob. Hi, Theo. How are you doing? Good, you? Yeah, very good. So this is it? This is the Empire? Yeah, this is Trunky Towers. Fabulous. Everywhere I look, Trunkies. Have you seen any or broken any trunkies since I last saw you? Not recently. I have seen absolute loads. In <laughs> fact, every time I go to an airport, there's a trunkie. I've got two little girls, Annie and Holly. Go, Dad, Dad, trunkie. Shut <laughs> up. Go, Dad, Dad, trunkie. And I have to make a look at the trunkie. <laughs> so they've never let me forget it. Over here, Sam's been working on this new concept called the Booster Pack. So it's essentially a backpack. Right. That doubles for the school run and on holidays as a booster seat, car booster seat. Oh, excellent. So, uh, so every time... product from Trunky there. I mean, one of the biggest problems you get when you've got small kids and you go to another country and you hire a car, you have to hire a booster seat yeah. or take your own. Yeah. So... Problem solved. How many products have you got now? Uh, we've got the range of Trunkies themselves. We've now developed this little saddlebag so when they're out and about, they've got a little day bag. <music> Joe over here is actually working on our Mark III, so... Uh, the one I took into the den was the Mark One. We then been that selling was, a Mark that, Two. That, that was the Mark One with a dodgy clip. Well, so, some <laughs> may say dodgy. Some may which say got dodgy. We, which got rectified very very quickly. Indeed. So this is a, a trunky Hercules. I should imagine any bolt cutters for this one, do I? <laughs> very nice. Tour complete. Theo's keen to discuss the company finances and to find out whether he was right not to invest in the den. So Rob. What was your turnover for 2009? It was 1.14 million, and uh, the previous year was about 700,000. Looking to significantly increase that this so year. So you did 740, 1.14, and what do you reckon about 2010? Over two million. Right, six million dollar question. If you do two million, what will the net profit be? Wouldn't be massive. Uh, probably about 100,000. Um, a lot of the, the excess on top of that has been reinvested in the business. Right, and in and the year that finished in February 2009, what did you show as a net profit on that one? The net profit was about 36,000. Right, that's, that's great growth, but that's top line growth. Mm -hmm. The bottom line isn't quite as impressive. Yeah. A lack of profit is like a cancer, it'll kill you off very slowly. So it, it really is imperative for you at this stage if you're growing this business and expanding this business, that you find, make sure that you have got the cash to go forward. The lack of cash flow is like a heart attack. Bang, you're dead. You can't pay the bills, you can't pay the pay you and you can't pay the VAT, you can't pay the rent. Yeah. That's it, it's over. And all I can say is I wish you the very best of luck. Great. Thanks a lot, Theo. It was great to come back and see Rob and see how he's gone. And he has done well. I mean, he's got his turnover to a million pounds. Profitability, not quite as good as I'd hoped. But he's got to concentrate on that. And I'm worried about his cash flow. And that's the problem a lot of small businesses are facing. The banks are not lending at the moment. It's one of the extra challenges we've got at the moment with the recession. 
Despite what you hear about the current economic climate and it's all doom and gloom, it's actually a fantastic opportunity for smallish businesses like mine to really grow. And to fund his expansion plans, Rob has managed to secure a much needed cash injection with a private equity investor, James Stevens. We've managed to secure an equity investment of £200,000 for 10% of the business, which values the business at £2 million, um, after three years of trading, which I'm very pleased about. Thank you very much. Cool, great. Well, thank you. Well done.